Babiš. I cannot stop it. But also because I want to cover many possibilities. This is like an index of a book that doesn't exist, but you, you can pick like the, the stuff you like and then go and go further on that. I will try to cover many much ground so you can find something you like there. And uh, I will read from the slides something I should, shouldn't do, but some definitions are important and the words are important, so I don't want to make a really bad summary about the language and somebody getting a I miscollectorized the language or something. Uh, that's not advancing. <laughs> yeah. uh, so my background, so you understand a little bit where I come from. I feel, I feel a little foreign here in this conference because I'm a, mostly a dynamically type functional programmer. And here everybody is a hardcore <laughs> type guy. Or mm -hmm. uh, this is what I used and deployed in production in the order in which I did it. So the last I did it in production was in Ixir this year, or last, last year, or like for the last couple of years, closure and closure script. And I, of course, I have a dark past with types and stuff like that. Uh, but so you understand when, when I make a mistake about type stuff, and it's because I'm not a really hardcore type. Uh, so, so why, why this talk? There's something that kind of bothers me, maybe it bothers you, maybe it doesn't. Uh, it's really weird that I can be, or people can be, as proactive as any other developer right now in 2020 using tools that are from the 70s. Like this is what I use, and it's not like I, I, I think it's cool, it's kind of sad, that I can like build software, put it in production, and not feel like I'm left behind or slower, and I'm using like B, Bing, Bash, uh, Make, Grep, and a uh, Unix derivative. I find that really weird. Uh, it's interesting with, with the right tools from the 70s and 80s, somebody can be a lot more productive. Like I've seen people do stuff with Lisp and Smalltalk that are like mind blowing. Uh, so, but those tools are from the 70s and the 80s. Uh, but you mean Lisp is from the 60s? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't want it to go like the definition, but yeah, from the, from the 60s. Yeah, uh, we can say it's similar maybe in the 60s too. Uh, uh, we need computer scientists or computer scientist people to create crud apps and they will have bugs. Uh, we need VC funding to create to-do apps. There are like to-do apps that have VC funding and they will have bugs too. That's really interesting. Uh, but uh, like the first part of the talk will be the, like the most negative. Don't think like I'm the, the old guy yelling at cloud, but I, I'm kind of that. But I'm not saying like the 70s were better. I'm saying like there are a lot of interesting stuff happening right now and the future can be much better and we can make cooler stuff. Uh, and I believe that the failure is around the languages. They, they are really cool, interesting languages right now, but the amount of complexity around the languages, the tooling, the processes and stuff like that, it's what makes programming really complex and requires like a PhD to do a crowd up. Uh, and uh, and I, I believe that uh, yeah, we, uh, that's also a, a part, an observation I had last time. I was at home and there were like three computers, three smartphones and two tablets on the table and there was nothing I could do to make something interesting with like 10 supercomputers in five meters distance and I want to do, use supercomputers that I have. Uh, so this is kind of the why I believe we are in some kind of local maxima of programming productivity on 
path we are. Like we, we found some local maxima, and we are doing like small percentage improvements in productivity, but there may be some other local maxima that we cannot see or that we can see, but it requires to go to a lower point in the efficiency before we, it gets better. And I want to explore what's out there. Uh, another way of saying it, because uh, I may not be it, explain myself good, there's an interesting uh, concept called hypernormalization. It was defined by an anthropologist from Leningrad. And basically the idea is that everybody in the Soviet Union knew that the system was failing, but no one could imagine an alternative to the status quo. So politicians and citizens were resigned to maintaining the pretense of a functional society. Over time, the delusion became a self-fulfilling prophecy. The fakeness was accepted by everyone as real. Like, this is the darkest part of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, if we cannot see like a, a better future and we are just stuck here because we cannot envision it, like am I trying to like predict the future? Uh, so it's really hard and I'm not the, the right person, but somebody else says that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And you can kind of prove that because if you travel back in time to the 60s, this was there. And what we are doing right now in dynamic functional languages can be traced back to Lisp. So you could live the future of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. If we went to search parts in the 70s and 80s, you could see what we are doing right now. Uh, so what I will, will try to see is what's around us right now that could be like a glimpse of nicer futures. And I tried this joke with some people outside and almost nobody got the reference. How many people know what uh, they live is the movie? No, you know it because I told you. Um, <laughs> three, okay. There's a movie from the 80s, you should see it, where somebody finds some glasses on the street, and when he like looks at something, he's, he, when he's not wearing the, the glasses, he sees normal stuff. And when he, when he puts the glasses, he sees like, the subliminal messages that society and capitalism give you. Uh, so you find some glasses after this talk, and you don't, you don't have it, and you go to Hacker News, and you see whatever you see, and then you put the glasses, and it's like, something else. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> so, uh, I hope that this is kind of a talk that uh, helps you help, start, help make a better future. And I, I'm sorry, one scene you cannot have seen it. So, uh, so I will start going through a lot of projects, well, not lot, like five or six, as time allows, to go over projects that exist right now, some that are like usable in production, some that are beta, some that are alpha, and as I go, it will be more abstract. But you can use this to, to do production stuff right now. The first one is the, the only dynamically typed one, and no, there, there's another one. And it's already available, you can use it. It's called Glamorous Toolkit, it's based on Smalltalk. And the idea of this is uh, like if I could summarize it is this a multiple development environment. Basically, you, it's not a programming language, it's a programming environment. The, like, Glamour's Toolkit takes care of not only the code in the text file, but everything that's around the development. And the, the multiple part is, there are more ways to see more representations, if you did to the previous talk, on software than just plain text on a, on a text file. So what if, instead of, like the developers of your IDE thinking on what kind of representations you may want to use and add them to the IDE. It gave you the, the foundation and the toolkit to build those tools as you go, how you need them for the specific problem. So for each specific problem, you are going to mold, if that's an English word, the environment to the way that's best for that problem. And, and there's a rule, I guess, I could summarize it that the idea of, of the developers of Glamour's Toolkit is that if you leave the environment for something, you lose. Like, if they lost, or they have to do something else. You shouldn't go out of your environment to check for documentation, to check for examples, to see the API, to find the solutions to problems, to debug, to anything. Everything should be in the environment. And I think that's a really interesting idea. It's a live notebook, in a sense, because it has components that allow you to compose something that looks like a live notebook. It has a flexible search interface. Uh, the search inter interface is baked in and global, and any object on the system can tell the search API how to be how it can be searched. So you can say like, whenever somebody is searching for something with with free text, how I should interpret that uh, that search and if if I match or not. So you can build like custom search for for your objects. Uh, I said it's it's based on Smalltalk. Uh, 
it's object oriented. Uh, it has a fancy code editor because it's code, but it also has built in a software analysis platform since uh, if it, like, it will be a repeating thing on the other tools, but these are live systems. Like, systems are li alive all the time. It's not that you code and you're like writing that text and then you build it and then you have something that runs and it's alive until it's not. Like this, your objects are alive all the time. So since objects are alive all the time and they are a graph, then they can build and make in tools to do analysis on, on that graph and present it in different ways. It has a data visualization engine that they use it themselves, but uh, they expose to, to you to extend to make visualizations of your code. And everything is integrated in a single thing. It has like many components. Uh, one is uh, like, uh, like the inspector um, that lets you define custom ways to present an object. One object or a class of objects can have many multiple different representations and you can pick the one you want to see at any given point in time. For example, you may want to see a, a, a directory or file object as, as an entry in a, in a list, in a list view, or you may want to see it as a graph, or you may want to see its content, or if it's a type you know, you might present it, so if it's a PDF, you can display it. So every, the objects can tell how they can present themselves. Uh, and you have a playground where you can play with the objects, like a repo. And you, it's, it has built-in concept of examples, so you can <coughs> find examples for your, for your code. Uh, and the cool thing is that you can do example-driven development, you exercise the API work while you are developing it, and at the end you have examples to show how the API is being used. And, and the, the users of, of that API can play with examples and understand better how it works. Uh, it's useful for documentation, but also for testing. A good example is a unit test of, of your code. Uh, so this is like the search interface, uh, you can search for stuff, uh, everything is live, like when you see something it's not like an image of a thing, it's the thing being displayed. Uh, it has, as uh, any small talk system, uh, a built-in built debugger, but not only that, you can specify custom debuggers for your objects. So if it's easier to, de to debug an algorithm displaying it as a graph, you can have a debugger that displays itself as a, as a graph. Uh, you can present your code as a presentation, uh, constructing views that are like an interactive narrative. And it's a, a different way to display your documentation or to display your examples or to like document your code. You can build presentations. It has a, like a built-in presentation uh, tool built-in. This is like the, the visualization uh, engine. And it's, it is a chart. Uh, it's, a, it's a vector base, so it looks nice in any, in any resolution. Uh, it has this interesting idea of, of uh, one uh, render tree, which basically at, the, at every single thing that's being displayed is a vector graphic, and you don't get this this thing when you you like drew, drop into a canvas and you cannot go inside of it and inspect it and manipulate it because it's pixels. <coughs> Everything is a vector and it's an object, so you can walk through a graph, which is basically vectors. A tree of vectors, and you can do whatever you want with them, uh, which is interesting. Uh, you can create and consume documentation from the tool. You don't have to go to an HTML page or, or search. Uh, and since you can write like documents and embed, of course you can compose all of this. You can create the views you want while you are developing. So if you start like creating a list view of documentation and examples and and code editors, you have a basically a Jupyter notebook. And they didn't have to build it, you just compose it. Uh, of course, if you want to integrate everything, it has really this uh, workflow built in. Uh, and, like, to get you an idea, is, let's see if uh, this will be weird. If, well, when, while I was doing these slides, one of the developers, uh, Tudor Girba, contacted me, and he asked me like what, what I was trying to present, and if he could help me, and he sent me a snippet of text, like 20 lines, and I just uh, pasted it in the playground, and uh, it, uh, a presentation with eight slides appeared. But the slides were not like dead images, like these ones. It was like I could click, and I could open, I can inspect, like the presentation he was showing me, I don't want to change, because I, I, never, I almost never do dual setup screens, so I don't want to break this, but I have it running here, I can open it if I'm allowed. But, so I, it went from dead images to like this, but I could click stuff and go back and forth and present it. Uh, the second language I want to present, like uh, uh, Grammar Struggit, you can download it, I have it running here in the 
Bagno. Uh, you can use it right now. It's, I think it's like production quality. I don't even think it's even better. And you can run it on any platform and it works. And it's, it's uh, based on Smalltalk, so it has a lot of time test test parts. Uh, the second language I want to cover is called Dark, Darkland, uh, which is uh, inspired by ML or Helm in, in that family of languages. Uh, you can go there, they are in private beta, but if you go to the beta waiting list, you will get an account in a couple of weeks. I got mine last week and I was playing a little bit with it. That's uh, the URL. Um, so, Darklang is, I guess, I'm like pitching for languages I didn't make, so sorry for the creators if they are seeing this. Uh, so, my observation with Darklang, I've been following for, for long time for talks and presentations they gave, but, but it's a, it can be used in a private beta for uh, two months. So the, the, the first impressions while I go through the examples and documentations and tutorial is that it's great for two things at least. It's uh, for everything you will consider, consider serverless, which is basically you want to deploy a piece of code in the clouds that reacts to some other systems and you don't want to care about like if the server is running or, or scaling or scaling up or down. For that kind of stuff, or for backends where you, you want to do a quick prototype, you need to attach like a mobile app or a web app to a backend, and you don't want to care about installing, deploying, uploading, making releases. Darkland shines at that, and it's like if I could summarize it, it's like what if we took all of the uh, like uh, accidental complexity out of creating services that run on the web or the cloud, or you want to call it. Uh, so it has a structured editor. It's not you are not editing text, but it feels like editing text, which is really cool. Uh, like when people complain about structured editors, is that that they have to learn some weird shortcuts or that it doesn't behave like text. It shouldn't, but this one behaves like text. It's web based. You do all your edition uh, on, on the web browser, and it's always live, like like the previous one. Uh, like uh, once you finish uh, editing something, you can run it, and it's running. Uh, as I said, it's in private beta. You can get a sense of it here. You have this canvas. You click somewhere. You create a cell. You say this is an HTTP service. You say run, and it runs, and it's it's already running forever. Well, not forever. <laughs> um, so you you have this this development environment, which is like a playground where you create like things, and you can create work workspaces, of course, because otherwise you will get pretty cluttered. So in this canvas. And in each workspace, you can like click, and you get like a, 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 um, like search for for the kinds of things you can create. Uh, right now, they have uh, HTTP handlers. Uh, you can create databases. It's built in into language. You don't have to like uh, in create an instance of a database somewhere and run it and connections and whatever. And it's fully supported by the language and the text editor. You can create functions whenever you are doing a HTTP handler and you want to reuse some function. You can extract it. You can create workers to, to handle like, like uh, yeah, work in queue and stuff like that. A cron handler which is a function or something that runs periodically, and a REPL to play with stuff before you copy and paste it somewhere. And the structured editor feels like text, as I said, but the cool thing is that like uh, it gives you this information, it uh, helps you, it does auto completion. The syntax is always valid. That's a nice thing, and it 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 evaluates. The, the code even when it's incomplete. So this incomplete is that it's evaluating the code and since you have some holes missing, the result of the evaluation is it's incomplete. But it's the cool thing is that it's all with the time evaluating and helping you. It, it always can help you because the, the syntax of the code is never wrong. It's all, always valid. It has a pervasive autocomplete uh, and evaluation. It's evaluating the expressions uh, whenever it can and it will autocomplete with fast search almost everywhere. Uh, it has a common palette, so you can uh, like do refactoring stuff uh, and similar stuff with uh, or common actions that you can do commonly. You can do it from there. Uh, you can run like anything actually, but with things that have side effects, you have to explicitly run them. Uh, things that don't have side effects will run automatically for you. Um, and uh, an interesting approach for that is that if you have a call that has arguments that have side effects, like one random call and one get current date, you, you have to explicitly evaluate it, but once you evaluate it, it gets the value, 
and it will evaluate the, the outer expression. And if you want to get a new value for random, you have to like explicitly tell like a new one. Otherwise, you will keep evaluating with the same same arguments. Like it, it runs the side, side effects on you when you tell. Um, it has an interesting concept that you can. It's kind of a example driven development. You can do a request on on like on your. URL on your server, and if that HTTP request exists, it will be added uh, to the left as an example of a request that landed on that handler. But uh, and but if uh, if it uh, there's no handler for that request, it will go to a 404 se section, and from there you can create a handler for that request. So you can start from an example, and once you start from the example, you can see the whole content of of the request, and when you are like calling the handler, you will get an autocomplete with, with uh, tooltips from the values you are uh, autocompleting. Um, as I said, the 404 section is here, and you can create a new handler for it, and you get uh, the handlers there. It has a built-in data store. It means you don't have to care about it or create an instance or fixing it. And it has, it has built-in integration, autocompletion. You can query it. And it has like the idea of scheme evolution. You can block a schema. You can migrate it. And uh, this I already covered. It will even evaluate stuff even when it's incomplete. <coughs> and so this is be a private beta, but I guess they will do a release in the following months. Uh, I would use it for everything, at least at the beginning, for everything you will consider, like uh, Lambda and uh, AWS. I would use this for quick prototypes or for backends that are basically a storage for stuff. I'm using it. They say they do not do GDPR compliance, so. Kind of, if you're in Europe, you can't. Uh, you can't store personal identifiable data. Yeah. It, uh, I think if you if you do authentication with an external service like AuthC or something, and you only get a token here, I guess you could. I, I talk to them. I, I'm not a seller of this. <laughs> uh, the third one is Unison. Uh, it's an open source, distributed programming language, always live. Again, repeated topic. <laughs> Yes. You say it's open source because the other ones, so that table is... Uh, the Glamour Toolkit is open source, uh, that that, uh, that line is not. Uh, yet, I don't know what's the plan. Uh, always live, ne never broken code bases, this repeats uh, from the previous one, both actually, always live, never broken, and always live always re also repeats from Glamour Toolkit. Uh, uh, interesting for functional programmers, it supports something called algebraic effects. They call them abilities, and it replaces monads. I don't have to learn what a monad is. Uh, uh, programs are not text here. Like you edit it as text, but the language uh, will compile them, type check it, parse it, and store an abstract syntax tree representation of the thing. It has something called content address code. Basically, the name of anything is the AST of the thing. So whenever you change something, it gets a new name. Of course, we humans don't like uh, SHA, uh, 512 identifiers. So we can map names to the, sh the hashes. Uh, so names are just metadata. By default, you will ship the name you gave to a thing. But somebody else can say, like, for this thing, I want this other name, and it will work. You can have like translations for APIs and stuff like that. Renames are, are really cheap, because it's just mapping a new name to the same hash. Uh, the code base is append only. Once you add a definition for a thing, since the name is the hash of, of the AST and the AST is like the canonical form, uh, you just keep appending definitions. You don't change the meaning of anything. You just add new meanings to make the same names. Um, so I, I guess um, it's implemented in Haskell. If you care, the previous one I think is implemented in OCaml, and the previous previous one is implemented in Smalltalk. It's uh, influenced by Haskell, Erlang, and a research language called Frank. Uh, it's statically typed, uh, and it's interesting this idea of, of it, a closure would say it, de it decomplects names. Names for humans, names for computers are two different things. Uh, and I, I think this is a good uh, the, the summary of the language. Here is an implementation, implementation of uh, distributed map reduce in the language. Uh, can describe the entire elastic distributed system that deploys itself at runtime. Uh, it, this function has the capability to fork new instances uh, of, of this computation. So the map reduce function resolves the map function, which is f, this c, which is the zero value when the collection is empty, the merge operation, and a sequence. And if the sequence is empty, it returns zero. If the sequence is one, it returns, it applies f to a, 
to t. And if it's two, it splits the computation into two, it, it creates two new instances, and it calls mob reduce on the left and the right, and when the results are returned, it merges the results. What it means to fork a new instance, it's something you provide, an implementation of the capability. You can have a capability that spawns process locally in a thread, another that one that does the same but injects failures, another one that deploys to an Amazon Web Service, another that, that forks to, to, to a cluster you have, uh, if the length of the collection is bigger than 100, whatever, you, you can plug the implementation of this thing. Uh, but distribution is in the thing. You don't like, write YAML, basically. Uh, and this is something they took. Uh, the API is serverless in the sense that nodes are not part of the programming model. Instead, it's up to the handler to decide how to for computation gets scheduled on the actual machine. So you can change your, if you're running on a laptop, you will like, instead of like having a local Kubernetes cluster and then a, a, an actual one, you, you change the strategy depending where you're running. Uh, the, it has some interesting properties based on how the language was defined. It has no builds. Uh, basically, since you're appending to this append only uh, list of definitions, uh, you don't have to build anything. Uh, it has no deploys in a sense because uh, nodes, as long as they trust each other, when when you fork a computation on another node and the node sees the, the IDs of the things it has run and they don't have it, they can ask other nodes to provide us those implementations. And since, since they are immutable, uh, you can start them forever because uh, it will never change. Uh, so you can like have like incremental deployment. Uh, rename is trivial, as I said. Uh, unit tests don't have access to the to like side effect capabilities, so once they run, you know that the result will be the same for the same definition of the function. So you run only, you type check and run uh, a function definition only once because it will never change. So you don't need to run the, that unit test on the same definition. Neither you nor nobody else because that definition is immutable. Uh, you don't have dependency conflicts, like because libraries basically or packages in other languages are basically a list of names to current versions of code. But since like, we don't have this computable computer ID, which is what's the content of that function, there can only be one instance of a module and uh, a name mapped to a, the implementation of a function. In this case, uh, like, you don't need that. You, could, you ha could have collections of name functions to, uh, to identify your hashes. So, and somebody else could like, change one and you your code won't care because your is tied to that implementation. Uh, it has automatic serialization since uh, the, the, the storage of the code is append only. When you define a type, that type will never change. So when you serialize something, you can serialize the values with the hash of the type. And when, when you deserialize, you can fetch the, the definition of the type and deserialize the values. Because the problem you have with serialization is, and deserialization is that we have a name for something, a type that evolves. So when you get something, you have this name of the thing, but you don't know which of the versions of, of the thing you have. And, and you may have lost the definition because you didn't ship with the new release. Here, since everything exists and it's immutable, you can serialize the, the ID of the type with the thing you're serializing and deserializing. How does it feel to develop? You have seen there are not many screenshots of Unix, and it's because the, the development is kind of uh, different. Um, you have a REPL. Uh, where you can search for code by names and types uh, and you can load the definitions into a scratch file which is a file in your favorite text editor and then you can manipulate it, you can have watch expressions uh, to, to evaluate the code, you can like have unit tests which are basically watch expressions that you <coughs> store with the definition and when you are uh, okay with the definition you will add it to the code base uh, and you can remove the scratch file. So your code base it's not like files in your file system, it's these definitions that you can load to your scratch file as, as you know. Um, the REPL watches for changes on the scratch files and it reevaluates whatever changed. And once you have the definition, you can commit them and remove your scratch files. Uh, definitions can be loaded back. Uh, so it's really different, uh, but also an interesting fact about this is that you stop needing like stuff like Git or GitHub, because you see, this is a content addressed network you can use whatever is useful for content address network. You, you could deploy this in IPFS or something like that. And you you don't need like central stuff that was down for a while the other day. Uh, 
Um, so this is really interesting and different. Where you, it's in alpha, you can download it and play with it. Where you would use it, for me, I guess if you play with Haskell and Agda and stuff like that, I guess you should check this. I, I, I really like it, but I don't know anything about that, so what do you know? Uh, this one is like a, a, a little bit of not the future, but I put it here because almost nobody knows about it. Like, if I could summarize it, it's like, NetLow is the answer to the question, what do ants, bees, traffic jams, nine mold, forest fires, segregation, fireflies, birds, and killing bakers have in common? Uh, so what they have in common is that they are like complex systems with emergent behaviors, except Kevin Bacon, well, Kevin Bacon too, but, but Kevin Bacon is uh, like a, a network, a, a rule, like almost everybody is six degrees of separation to get Kevin Bacon, it has been proven. You can check this uh, website. I will show videos of this working because I think it shows better how it works. You can check this one because the video of this one didn't look really nice. But in this website, it shows like fireflies have uh, an algorithm, internal algorithm, that where they can synchronize their, their internal clocks to like flash at the same time, certain types of fireflies in, in Asia. So if you go at some point in the, in the jungle, it will be all dark and then pff, it will like, light up. It's because they just synchronize the, the internal clocks and when they're that's basically really simple agents following two or three rules that have emergent behavior that you could not like, guess from like, reading the rules. Uh, here is uh, one like, uh, I like talking about ants. Uh, this is uh, the algorithm that ants use to find food and communicate the fact that food is somewhere to other ants. And, uh, they use it by, the right, when, when they don't have food, they walk randomly and when they find food, they grab something and go back straight to the to the ant hill and they leave pheromones that um, that they evaporate so they, it's like a timer and when when a randomly walking ant finds some pheromones it follows it in the in the gradient of the food and it finds food and goes back and segregate pheromones uh, so uh, more ants will follow the the, the traits that have more uh, pheromones and when when the food uh, runs out the pheromones will evaporate and they will start me. And this can be used to solve the trout and Setsman problem in a really interesting way too. Uh, there's an interesting consensus algorithm on bees. How do, do they decide to where to create the new, the new beehive? They, it's really because it's really interesting, but they will go randomly also when they find a, bee, a place that could be a beehive. They evaluate it, they come back to the, the current beehive and they do a dance. And if they convince other bees, they will follow them and they will check for themselves and they come back. And when a majority of bees are dancing in a one way, they will just move the, the, the beehive there. So consensus algorithms by, bee, by bees. This one is like uh, how birds flock, which is they, uh, some kinds of birds end up like behaving like a system that moves as if it have, Sorry? Murmurations. Murmurations, exactly. That's the name. And it's just following three rules, uh, which you can check on the blog, of course. You can play with it here. Uh, there's also another interesting uh, idea of uh, phase transitions. Like if you have a forest uh, with uh, a density of 57%, the forest fire will eventually, no matter how many times you run it, it will uh, die at 20% or something. But if you go to 60%, just 3% uh, more, the fo whole forest will uh, set on fire. And this is what's called a phase transition. If I told you the rules about forest fires, you could tell me, oh, I, I guess at 60% uh, density, the forest will set fire. So these are not things that you can, or unless you're a genius, uh, you can evaluate by looking at the rules. It's emerging behavior of the system. You can see how like segregated neighborhoods happen even when individual persons are not racists. You can read the algorithm. There's one for this the system people, it's called the small war phenomenon, which is related to Kevin Bacon, which is you can have like a really efficient uh, a graph that covers all the nodes in less than six, uh, six uh, steps uh, by following a pretty random uh, algorithm. There's a paper, it's called the small war phenomenon. And here you can play with it and see that it actually does what it does and it will chart like uh, the properties of the network and, and you can start changing the parameters and stuff like that. Where am I going with this? How traffic jam jams happen? Like you have, if you have a circle and you put cars at, at the same speed going around, a traffic jam will happen. Why? 
And uh, the, here you can explore why, it's because basically it takes a while for cars to react to stop or start and you will get a traffic jam even in a, in a circle. But if I ask you at what, at which amount of cars and which distance and which properties does it happen or does it stop happening, you don't know. You have to play with it to get a sense of the thing. Uh, there's a complete group of people doing this. I recommend you the first one, Explorables. This one, Distilled Power, is also interesting. It's kind of writing papers, but using these Explorable explanation things. Uh, uh, Com Complexity Explorer, or the people are behind the logo. And the idea of this is there's another way of using programming, which is as what's called a tool of thought, which is a tool to think, a tool to communicate with other humans, a tool to understand phenomenon. And also it's useful, this is useful for, uh, to make people understand like complex ideas like why vaccination works, uh, global warming, and stuff like that. Uh, and it's useful for, for uh, journalism, it's useful for policy, like if somebody proposes a policy, give me a model that shows that that policy will make sense. Let's play with the parameters and stuff like that. And uh, check this, they're really interesting. Um, whoa, I will have to go much faster. Hey, so uh, it's a, at this point it's a research project, so you can play with it there, and that's a website, but it's like, I don't know what comes before alpha, but it's that. It's an experimental programming environment, as I said, uh, so it's not a, just a programming language, and the idea of Hazel is that every incomplete program that can construct, can be constructed using Hazel's language of type aware detection, so we'll see what that means if I have time, it's both statically and dynamically well defined, uh, it has a possibly incomplete type and can run it to produce a possibly incomplete result. What it means is that a Hazel program at any given point in time can be processed by Hazel and it will tell you whatever it can tell you about the thing, but at any given point in time it will tell you I cannot parse or syntax error or, uh, or I cannot give you information about this piece of code because, because incompletion, errors and incompletion, incomplete states of the program are part of the specification. Uh, it, uh, it has a structural editor, like the other ones, and let's not all the other ones. Uh, it has this concept of type aware edit actions. Basically, in the definition of the language, is the semantics of editing code. Uh, it has a structural or projectional editor, uh, but feels like text. You can play with it online if you don't believe me. Uh, execution doesn't stop on holes. Like, if I have an incomplete piece of program, it will have like a type and a value that represents the lack of completeness. It won't stop there, it will just continue and it will give you a result. Uh, it has different types of holes. The empty holes is for an expression that is not complete yet. Uh, it has non-empty holes for errors. Like it, but here it behaves like a dynamic inside language. It has uh, holes for binding errors, which basically you put a name in a place that it's not bound to anything. And they are exploring conflict holes, basically, if, if like conflicts in Git, uh, there are two versions of the code here and the tool doesn't know which one is which, it can have both at the same time. Or if you're doing collaborative edition, like with stuff like CRDTs and some both, more than one developer are changing the same place, then like the language understands the concept of this place has more than one value. Uh, here is my attempt at using it. Uh, it's really interesting because you, you can make all the mistakes you want and Hexel will tell you something about it. Like, look, this doesn't make sense. Two is not a function. I forgot to put the, the multiplication there. And it understands like, this is, um, this is yellower than this because like, how it's called, like, evaluation order. And um, the last one, I think, from the first part, which is, uh, I will skip the second part. It's dynamic length, which uh, you should see this talk because I will say things that are not right. It's the human representation of thought by uh, the creator of dynamic land. And, and it's a communal computer designed, designed for uh, agency, not apps, where people can think like whole humans. So we'll see what that means. Uh, the computer of the future is not a product, but a place. And that place is in Oakland, California, so you have to go there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have to go. Um, one of the ideas is that programming conflates two things, engineering, the, which is communicating intent to the computer, which statically typed persons care a lot, and authoring, communicating intent to humans, which us, the dynamic type guys, care a lot about. And many of, many of the ideas of, of the dynamic land is that this is the different ways in which people understand code, and understand anything or learn anything, and we programmers only use visual and symbolic. What if we use all the other senses? 
and because of time, I will go over. I will have a video of a website which is really opposed to this talk. <laughs> but uh, you see that it's people around a table using these pieces of papers. That they basically use what it means to be human and what it means to communicate to explore a program. It's not that uh, code. And it's related to explorable explanations, and I don't have much time, but then is they say that we are creating a new dynamic medium, which is like whatever program is, and but we are taking a lot of ideas from the previous dominant medium, which is print the printing press, the books and the paper. We should like take advantage of the dynamic medium. And it's a really far into the future uh, project, which is what will happen when like material, like real world material things can be can compute. And what they say is basically right now everything we create is behind this glass and we only use our hands and our eyes to interact with it. Sometimes not even our hands, like keywords. And the idea is at the, in the long term what if we could model while we speak, at the pace we speak to explain, to explore. And what like and this will involve like learning by playing with models. And what if instead of us being up like outside and the program being there we would be in the program. So like a museum or learning something would be walking into place. And another example we use is when I'm walking here and I'm using like dead images. What if like I use the spatial concept of here to have like the, the, the things I present and I would walk through the things and I would interact with the way. Check it because it's much more interesting to, me, to what I'm saying. And two small ones uh, that you can use right now. Uh, related to this concept of supercomputers in your table, uh, the, there's this idea of CRDTs and where you can use a model of data with some properties and limitations that allows you to like uh, share the state of something between distributed entities. I'm really bad at summarizing, but check the site. There's a definition there that I remember it. Like correct, write correct distributed programs. You write it once, and it will be behave the same whether it's executed in one computer or distributed across many. That. And it's being used, for example, there's an implementation of Microsoft Orleans in Erlang called Orleans, and it uses LASP to do the node stuff, the, the placement of actors. And if you do JavaScript and you want to do a collaborative thingy, uh, you can use AutoMerge, which is a JSON -like data, data structure that can be replicated. So when one node modifies it, it will eventually be and I don't have time to go to this, but there's another whole area called programming by example and demonstration. There are two online books, one for programming by example, the other for programming by demonstration. And I don't have time to go over what I hope you can ask me later. We have a whole book. So this is my take. Like programming by example and demonstration is what if instead of, mod of manipulating the logic and having the data hidden, we have the data and we manipulated the data and our program extracted the meaning of our manipulations and could run it again when uh, new data is available. Basically there I have a table and I sort it and I rearrange the columns and I create an aggregation and a filter and this is the query, select the sum of attendances run by something, filtered by something else and it feels like a, a notebook style and I have a chart in a couple of drugs and drops. Uh, this is programming, kind of, it's a mix between programming by example and programming by demonstration. And if I want to sort this, I just sort the table and it gets sorted. Uh, so do what I need, basically. Uh, and this is another example that, yeah, zero minutes left. Uh, it does something similar. Oh, it, yeah, I won't explain it. But it basically concatenates two queries to, to do a more complex case. And if you want to go more meta or more crazy or more into the future and conventional programming, which is has something like chemical computation, amorphous computation, autonomic computation. And this uh, person on YouTube, Rob Spheres Computation, which has a site, but it, and he posts one, one update per week working on this. He's created a platform of small computers that you can apply and scale to the level you want using the autonomic computing ideas. And you code it like kind of like and I'm closing, sorry for being too late. A way to predict the future is to find in the present and be part of it. So uh, be part of the projects you think are a better, better, better future. And 